Hi, everybody. Um, it's good to know that you're back today um, so that I can read some another excerpt, this time from Chapter 12, Stories That Matter, from my new book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. Um, I've been reading a chapter, excerpts from a chapter a day, and we'll continue to do so every weekday until May 26th. Um, as I've said, I wrote this book as a love letter to anyone daring to make change in this fragile, fractured, um, yet ultimately beautiful world of ours. Um, manifesto for a Moral Revolution. I've been doing so many book talks and this question keeps coming up. Why moral? Why revolution? And as I say, um, moral because we have to renew our values. We have to renew our sense of who we are to one another, to remember that we are each other's destiny. When we live separately from one another, we could depend on a set of prescribed rules from an authority above. Now, there are many different tribes, nations, cultures, religions that have operated according to different structures, and we have to find a way to solve our problems together, to live together, and that requires that we agree on critical minimum values, a common minimum, if you will. And um, if you look at every great religion, if you look at every great moral authority, that common minimum is our human dignity. We use lots of different ways of speaking about it, but that is really what this is. And if we start there and remember that we are the system, we create the systems in which we live and we have a choice, well then we can think and structure the way we use capital, the way we use the tools of technology, knowledge, skills, to solve our biggest problems together. This book is essentially 12 new operating principles and more importantly, practices. Why practices? Because practices help form habits and habits create character. And this is really about character. One of the tools and skills that are therefore needed for moral revolution, for this idea that we've got to redefine and rebuild all of our systems, whether it's healthcare or housing or criminal justice or education or politics, um, is telling stories that matter. And that's the name of chapter 12. Um, tell the stories that matter. Because narrative drives everything. In, in my own life and building acumen, narrative drives strategy. Uh, show me a happy person, and I will bet that that person will tell you the narrative of her life in a way that accentuates the positives, even tragedies, even failures, not pushing away from those failures and tragedies, acknowledging it, them, holding them, but seeing them not as end points to their lives, but turning points. How we tell the stories about ourselves has a lot to do with our mental health, even. How we tell the stories of others can have enormous repercussions for how they see themselves. And so it's not only important that we tell stories that matter, but that we have many different voices in a world with such glorious diversity telling their own stories. And so if you want to lead, if you want to build, and I hope that you do because this world needs all of us, then you need to learn to tell stories in ways that don't shirk from the hard and the ugly and the realities, but that stay focused on the possible. Whether you're talking about a person, an event, a place, a nation, our world. So here's an excerpt from chapter 12, Tell Stories That Matter. Aren't you too idealistic? Sorry. 
aren't you too old to be so idealistic about Africa? A prominent Nigerian businessman taunted me with a smile during a 2009 dinner party in a posh home in Accra, Ghana. Around the long rectangular table with me were 18 West African businessmen and my colleague, Catherine Casey Nanda. The air held the scent of frangipani and formality. Catherine and I were at the table to introduce Acumen to potential philanthropic supporters in West Africa to paint a picture of what Acumen was capable of igniting in the region and to set the stage for raising local funds. Catherine had already shared anecdotes of potential investments we would make in Nigeria and Ghana, stories that offered strong testimony to the potential of our work. The night had been progressing swimmingly. Then I launched into a perhaps too rhapsodic address about Acumen's work from a more global perspective. The man's question about my idealism took me by surprise. His words were skeptical, his tone cynical. I was conscious of my race, my outsider status, and the larger stakes of this first meeting to introduce West Acumen to West Africa. At the same time, I experienced the man's provocation as an affront to what my team and our collective work represented. Into the center of that table, with its starched and pressed linen and its sterling silver, attended by uniformed men wearing pristine white gloves, the charismatic questioner had thrown down a gauntlet. I reached across the finery to accept the challenge, asking the man what he meant by the question. Just what I said, he said flatly. Aren't you too old to be so idealistic about Africa? Now all eyes were on me. I choose idealism as an antidote to cynicism, I said, locking the man's eyes with my own. That doesn't mean I don't see the ugly or the challenges. I'm trying to picture how I would inspire an audience by describing only the continent's underbelly. Isn't West Africa about much more than that? Internally, I could feel the presence of two voices, one telling me to put a muzzle on my mouth, the other one urging me forward. Would you rather I spoke about some of my experiences with incompetence or corruption or abject indifference? I asked as the timbre of my voice gradually crescendoed. For I could give a lecture on any of those topics. I could also share anecdotes of elites who talk a big game of love and peace only to let down their country men and women, knowing that as long as they are in the right clubs, the world will applaud their riches and ignore their misdeeds. Or I could recount the times I've been held up, mugged, assaulted, robbed, and threatened. I could speak about colleagues of mine who fought for justice for years only to be murdered during the Rwandan genocide or describe others who capitulated finally to their insecurities and their thirst for power, ultimately joining the perpetrators of that bloodbath. I took a breath, if only to quell, to stem my swelling emotions. Sometimes I concluded, there are days when I have to fight a hardening of my own soul from seeing too many people treated like throwaways. So yes, I can paint the op opposite of idealistic for you. But as the Nigerian author Chimimanda Aditya says, there is more than a single story. Of course, I can tell stories of lightness and darkness about every country I know, especially my own nation. But we were talking about a continent that had shaped my identity and in many ways had taught me what real love is. Anger rose inside me like my chest, like a clenched fist, as that part of me that had committed to showing up with real love, not easy love, felt threatened. And the man had asked me the question on the wrong night. Or maybe it was the right one. I was in the middle of a family crisis that seemed to parallel our dinner discussion. A month earlier, my 35-year-old sister Amy had undergone brain surgery that had left her entire left side paralyzed. 
The surgeons had told her she might never walk again. She was in rehab in New York City, and we knew, regardless of the outcome, that the road ahead would be a long one. But you don't want to mess with my sister. Amy understood the prognosis. We all did. She knew that parts of her body would be slower to return to mobility if they ever did, and that other parts held more potential. She was studying every kind of therapy imaginable, supported by a tight community of family and friends who accompanied her, aware that in the end, she was the one that would have to do the excruciating work of recovery. And my sister kept to a single narrative. You don't get to choose what happens to you, but you do get to choose how you respond. When I'm in the room with my sister, I said to those at the table, we listen carefully to the surgeon's dreary words, but we don't dwell on them. Instead, we talk about the wedding. My sister is planning with her prince of a fiance. I tell her how much I'm looking forward to dancing with her. I continued, some might say that is foolish optimism or too idealistic, but believe, but I believe you become the story you choose to tell. While my family can accompany my sister, that's all we can do. Amy has to do the heroic work of fighting every day. She's focused and tough, and she refuses to acquiesce to narratives that would have her accept what many see as inevitable. And you know what, I continued, mark my words, I will dance with my sister at her wedding. I paused long enough to notice that everyone had stopped eating. Make it, make of it what you'd like. But I am dedicated to contributing to the growing movement of enterprising, committed, capable, ethical, and public spirit, spirited African social entrepreneurs who are serving their communities, nations, and this very continent. I am betting on individuals who will not be hemmed in by other people's narratives. Look, the negatives I've described about Africa are truths, just like those my sister surgeons hold about probabilities of recovery. Equally as real, however, are the stories of astonishing creativity and hard work on this continent. Kenya's mobile banking technologies have leapfrogged services in the West. Nigeria's Nollywood is the third biggest film industry in the world. I've met brilliant scientists, technologists, doctors, musicians, poets, writers, philanthropists, activists, teachers, and yes, even politicians here, all of whom are ser focused on serving the greater good. I have been humbled by the wisdom of people in this region who have known great suffering, yet still are determined to try to give and forgive. It is all here, all of it. The question is, which stories will we tell? Those reeking of despair or those imbued with a hard-edged hope? The man's mouth broke into a toothy smile. Hey, he said, I'm a journalist. I pay, I'm paid to be skeptical. I get that, I replied. I just have to beat the drum for hope. You know, as a radical response to cynicism. He insisted he wasn't cynical, just skeptical, and everyone laughed. Maybe because the discussion was so real and so raw. Catherine and I found ardent supporters that night people whose efforts helped us build a program now based in Lagos, Nigeria, whose stories of possibility, acumen, and scores of fellows and entrepreneurs can now tell. The job of the moral leader, which is the job of all of us, is to learn to tell the stories that matter, stories that unite and inspire, reinforcing our individual and collective potential and paint a picture of the future that we can build and inhabit together. Stories that matter are not stories that demean, deride, divide, ridicule, belittle, blame, or shame. We must take the harder path of telling stories that hold our truths, both the ugly and the beautiful, while remaining later laser focused on the possible. Our hope for a moral revolution rests on telling stories that unite, that challenge stereotypes and easy prejudices, 
and that ultimately reinforce our dignity. Telling those stories effectively, however, requires a humility that acknowledges the light and dark in all of us. When you dare to tell your full story, you will inevitably touch people who relate to your most vulnerable elements. And as you dive into the most more painful stories from your past, you may find clues to help shape the story of who you want to become. At Acumen, we asked new cohorts of fellows to do an exercise called River of Life. First, the fellows pair off and discuss the twists and turns of their lives. Then each fellow shares his or her own story with the full group of about 20 or so people. Each narrative contains moments of success and joy, and inevitably, times of sorrow or hurt, tragedy or shame, and sometimes all of these. They tell of childhoods trapped in crushing poverty, of tragic losses born too young. They've grown up in refugee camps or they have lived in terror of the Taliban, Naxalites, paramilitaries, or the police. They've been betrayed, they've been abandoned. Some have suffered physical or sexual abuse. The stories make you weep. Every fellow has a story worth telling, all of them adding to the story of us, a story still unfolding. Listening to people share stories of trauma or loss within their life trajectories is a profound reminder that our tragedies neither define nor destroy us. How we respond to our trauma plays a much greater role and therein lies the groundwork for the most important stories we can write, not with pen and paper, but in the way we conduct our lives. The stories shared during the River of Life exercise are reminders that some individuals choose service and kindness or commit to fighting for justice in order to defy the darkness. Shamim Akhtar was born to a 13-year-old father and a 15-year-old mother in a speck of a village outside a small city called Mirkbarkas in the vast desert of Sindh, Pakistan. Shamim's father, just a boy himself, was initially devastated at bringing a girl into the world. The story for girls in his tribe was that of being unworthy, a burden. He and his wife wanted more for their child. Shamim's father had an elder brother, one of the first in his family to attend university. The elder suggested that the young couple raise Shamim as a boy, dress her as a boy, treat her as a boy, and most, most important, educate her as a boy. No girl of their village had ever attended school, and this plan would allow her to learn. Thus began Shamim's adventures as a little boy, climbing trees, riding bicycles, and attending school, while her cousin stayed indoors to learn to cook and clean. Shamim sat at the feet of elder men during jirgas or councils, absorbing the rules and practices of political negotiations. Unlike the village girls, she had the chance to read newspapers, ask questions of male elders, and dream of other places. During a long discussion with Shamim at Acumen's Karachi office in July 2018, she shared with me the contradictions of her childhood. I felt sorry for the girls in my village, but disliked spending time with them, for they spoke about clothing and makeup, things that bored me. It made no sense that the boys had the same hands and feet as I did yet were treated so differently. I studied hard to be the best in my class and prove what girls could do. I asked her if she had dreaded finally becoming a girl. Yes, very much, she admitted. By the time I was 16, the villagers could see I was female and many men insulted my father. Maybe they didn't like watching a daughter do better than their sons. And though being treated as a boy gave her physical and mental confidence, Shamim still feared walking alone in a dress at the university she was then attending. And her story was not hers alone. Though her father was not yet 30 when Shamim left for university, he accompanied her through every challenge. When she expressed her apprehension to him, he said simply, I didn't raise you to be afraid. Though her father endured misunderstanding himself and ridicule for the way he raised Shamim, 
His determination that she succeed never wavered. This is a story of a father's love as well as of a daughter's courage and capability. When we dare to push the edges of comfort, the narrative we tell ourselves can shape shift and transform the world. After university, Shamim learned of a job opportunity with the regional NGO, a five hour bus ride away from her village. Again, she asked for her father's blessing. And again, he said yes. But she was the one who decided to live a story that would have no limits, regardless of the costs. Her education had gifted Shamim with dreams unavailable to people like her, and she was not going to squander them. Shamim's new job exposed her to her country's diverse people and places, and also to its poverty. Now I could see how much more privileged I was than poor women who were dying in childbirth because they were too far from a hospital or whose poverty forced them to choose which of their children to feed. Her perspective broadened further when as an Acumen Fellow in 2015, she met with leaders from across her country. In 2016, inspired by the life choice of others, choices of others, Shamim decided to leave her job at the NGO and returned to her region to bring education to other little girls. By then, parents of children were more amenable to the idea, especially those who would witness Shamim's family receive the money she sent back home. But nothing prepared her for the feeling of seeing a classroom full of little Shamims, looking back at her as she told the stories of Nelson Mandela and other history-making individuals. Those bright, shining faces were worth the cost of her two-hour bus ride, twice daily, to reach the schools. In the course of the next few years, Shamim would also earn her PhD. Shamim's narrative is filled with layers and lessons about the value of education, the power of courage, and the strength that comes from having someone in your court. Her story also reveals the incalculable potential loss when we deny any human the freedom to learn and to contribute. And Shamim does not need anyone else to tell her story. In November 2017, I had the great privilege of curating a session for the TED Women Conference in New Orleans, a session in which Shamim participated. She arrived from Karachi on Halloween night and the city streets were overflowing with residents in outlandish costumes, portraying every ghoulish, irreverent, celebrity character and personality imaginable. Shamim took it all in stride, though I assured her that Halloween in New Orleans was not the only story of that city. Two days later, she stood proudly on stage. The TED conference had given this child of the desert, born to illiterate teenage parents, a platform to speak in her own words, on her own behalf. In return, Shamim spoke for every child who has been overlooked because of their gender, race, ethnicity, class, or disability. Our collective story is a mosaic of narratives that inspire our better selves, counter those who would divide us, and reveal the hidden gifts and capacity that the world would rather not see. The story of us is, of, is ultimately that of love forever unfolding. And no story matters more than that. And one more thing. One of the most indelible memories of my life is dancing wildly with my sister Amy at her epic, unforgettable wedding. Tell the stories that matter. Right now we're seeing too many of our leaders tell stories that divide us, tell stories that we're not as good as we know we are. Um, so tell those stories. And I forgot to tell you to ha ask questions, but let me see. Um, thank you, you are asking. Here we go. Goodness gracious, lots of questions. And lots of comments, thank you guys. Um, how can we pass these stories that matter? Thanks, Haluk. 
to those who define themselves on the other sides of the divides. I think this goes to um, how do we connect across identity um, and, and to tell the truth to each other. You know, I, I mentioned um, shape shifting in this chapter. And I think that that's a really big part of the story. I have um, been in situations where people look at me and they think, I'm completely on the other side, um, other. It might be a, a conservative military group um, that is worried about liberal elites that are all about the globe and not about the nation. And so rather than come in and, and speak about acumen only from this perspective of you know, one world, um, even though I deeply believe in that, so do I understand the importance of local rootedness. And so I start by making a connection, which is the story of us. I'm a child of a military officer. I grew up in a conservative area in the United States. I see so much power and beauty in tradition. And I understand that some traditions are no longer fit for an interdependent world. And so it's to us to bring forward the beautiful and have the courage to jettison um, what no longer serves us. And so I'll start a conversation saying that I'm the proud daughter of a military person and that I, I love the idea that General Marshall, who was the person um, who created the Marshall Plan, he used to talk about um, citizen leadership, um, no, the citizen soldier, and how all of us needed to hold these ideas of patriotism. And that'll be my starting point, that I see myself as a citizen soldier. It's not language I would always use, but it's a way that I can, I can show my respect. I can start a narrative that comes from, without having to say, I respect you, but that starts by saying, I see you and you are part of my narrative and then start to build from there and to become more challenging. And I would also say, tell those stories in a way that um, are deeply honest. That's hard. But every time I found that courage to um, say, and here's where I disagree, because I've started with where I agree then there's much more of an open field for real conversation. And so um, right now, the most important thing is to tell the stories that matter outside of our sanctuaries, as fellow Steph Steers would, would say, outside of the people who think just like we are. And so our, our stories can get a little bit more expansive. In this time of coronavirus, one of the most important stories is that we truly are all in this together and that we, we all have a duty that includes a level of sacrifice that we haven't, we haven't used words like duty and sacrifice for a really long time. And, um, and yet, the reason that we social distance isn't to protect ourselves, it's to protect other people. Um, we have a whole legion of essential workers who are redefining what is most important who our essential workers are, our healthcare workers, many of whom are, are putting their lives on the line at great risk, who are sacrificing the quality of time they get with their families, our garbage collectors, people who work in our schools. We're redefining and building new narratives of what education is. And every parent that is having to homeschool a child is starting to understand the narrative of how important a teacher is and how hard it is to teach. I hope we can hold these stories and bring them into the future um, in a way that also recognizes that the only way we beat this narrative, be, that we beat this virus, is if we tell a story of all of us globally and we think globally, but we also recognize that we have to be kind and focused and build systems locally. And that these false divides are getting us nowhere. 
All they're doing is distracting us from the work, our work. And that's why this moment offers a unique opportunity to, know, to tell the new stories of entrepreneurs who are pivoting and bringing the best that they're seeing in the world, not just of markets, but of government and of civil society, that we need these systems to create change, that each of us is needed, every one of us, to reach out and tell new stories, not only of what we can do, but how we do it. And then finally, as I see a move as well to more of an authoritarian kind of great man approach, we need to tell a story that's really about the fact that we don't need another hero. If we're going to beat this and build the world that we know is possible, we need a million heroic acts. And, um, and that goes back to the whole purpose of the book. It is to each of us to imagine and build the world in which we can all flourish. That's the moral revolution. Um, and so thank you for coming. If you, my big pitch, if you read this, not just read this book, if you buy this book before May 26th, um, we have a master course. It's 12 weeks long. The team has done an incredible job and there's a diversity of voice, voices that, that go through each of these principles and practices. Um, and it's free, otherwise $200, but only if you buy the book and sign up before May 26th. Um, otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for showing up.